welcome back if this is your second joining. Um, if you're this is your first time, hi, I'm really glad you're here. My name is Ashley. I'm assistant professor Snohomish County 4-H with Washington State University. And I see Adasha Turner on our or attendee list. Uh, she's the founder of Uma Sustained Modest Family Solutions. And I'm really glad to have a partnership with her because she connected me with our fabulous presenters. And we're going to learn more about how to use facts to combat fear. Thank you. Hey, everybody. I, my name is Terry Kylo. I've been a Lutheran pastor for about uh, 30 years now. And as I said last week, you know, I, I realized about five, six years ago that there was a pretty intense campaign of dehumanization, really well funded and very effective against our American Muslim neighbors. And I realized that that was a lot like what happened in Germany against our Jewish neighbors there. And I knew that I could not be silent in the face of that. Um, we wanna be clear that, you know, we're not trying to proselytize anybody or convert anybody to a specific religion or to any religion at all. But, but here's the deal. Um, if folk are being dehumanized on the basis of religion, then we should know something about that religion and, and from people who practice it. So in other words, it's important to learn about Islam from practicing Muslims, um, not from people who hate them. And it's important to learn something about uh, Islam from, from people uh, who are practicing it within kind of the mainstream of that tradition and not from folk that use that tradition to justify uh, their violence or, or other kind of hateful acts. So it's just really important to, to learn about Muslims from Muslims. And I, I'm doing this because I'm an American and I believe in our, in our aspirational constitutional values of freedom of religion and human rights for everyone. I also do it as a Lutheran, as a Lutheran Christian, um, because I believe uh, you know, Jesus stood with Samaritans. He stood with people that were being dehumanized in his day and I think that he would want me to do this today as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anila so you can get to know her a little bit more. Hi, I'll take the mic. It's Adasha here, um, founder of Modest Family Solutions and Uma Sustain Institute. Um, I'm very proud to be on this journey with Ashley and you all at um, Pathways to Understanding and Anila um, as we combat facts over fear. A little bit about me um, and why I've started um, on this mission here is that I've been working in the communities uh, on the intersectionalities between different religious um, faith organizations, um, identities being, whether it's black, Muslim um, and other avenues. And we seem to always be derailed you know, off the pathway of humanity. And so as we're starting to found a lot of these organizations and do community, community social justice work, there's just been a lot of opposition really to not really the projects that we have, but just to us as a people. So I really wanted to um, open the forum to where we could really get to know each other and know just great opportunities that are out there once we look past the intersectionalities and really recognize each other as humans. Um, and a lot of times those, these forums aren't there. So I wanted to bring that to Washington State University and 4-H participants, faculty, um, and anyone out there who has, you know, um, a youth development or a teacher, you know, to know and understand what our youth are going through in this um, misinformed society that we live in, you know, to where we can have those conversations and have our questions answered, you know, on an even playing field, you know, and know that you have an ally on both ends, you know, someone that you can ask um, questions and not feel like, you know, it's just uncomfortable spaces and carry that all the way out. Um, and we can kind of get over those together. So um, thank you again for having me here. Thank you, Ashley, for um, letting me present uh, Facts Over Fear here, and we'll give it over to Anila. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much, Adasha, for the introduction and for bringing this program, and Ashley for helping being uh, promoted to 4-H and uh, Wazoo. Uh, it is, I'm, I'm really excited to be here with all of you. Uh, again, for those who are returning, uh, my name is Anila Afzali and I am the Executive Director of the American Muslim Empowerment Network at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound. Uh, I am, as I said last week, a recovering attorney. Uh, I left my legal career in 2013 after a spiritual transformation uh, that brought me back to my faith. And since then, I've really been working on building bridges of understanding and unity with people from, from all over, understanding that we are all in this together. And in the work that I do, I'm really driven by my aspirational American values. 
along with my faith values, which include things like loving your neighbor and bringing the most benefit to society, doing our part for good. And part of the work that I've been able to do, I feel very lucky and fortunate to get to work with my dear brother, Reverend Terry Kylo, in creating programs like this Facts Over Fear program that really is about humanizing each other and building the kind of bridges and getting the kind of information that we need to withstand misinformation and dis information campaigns and propaganda efforts that seek to divide we the people. So that's what I'm excited to, to get to come back and, and talk to all of you uh, about our topic this week, which is about Islam and peace. It's such an important one, uh, but I'll let it, uh, I'll let Reverend Terry take us, uh, kick us off first with a video. Go ahead, Terry. Uh, thank you, Anila. And I uh, want to let everybody know that you can find out more about our overall Facts Over Fear campaign at factsoverfear.org. And uh, look up hashtags, of course, on social media, and uh, and you can look at um, at all these different um, these different social media sites out there, and especially on YouTube, we have a lot of videos now. Our webinar today will be about one hour. We ask you to uh, ask questions using the Q and A, and we'll be monitoring those throughout our time together. We first just want to share with you just a super brief version of our of how you communicate to people around you know, change when they're being fearful, when they're in a fearful state toward another group. And uh, calling the people racists or calling them names or, or looking, giving them disgusted looks is not gonna help. So first you wanna meet the emotion, not the myth. So understand how they're feeling. Reframe their questions or concerns when you need to. Build on shared values. Tell a positive story about the group that they're concerned about. Follow with some facts and data and continue the conversation. And don't turn somebody into a project and don't start shaming people because they disagree with you, but hang in there with them for the long haul on that. And so now we're gonna show you our video. It's about three minutes long or so. And we're really excited about these and we hope you enjoy it. Islam envisions a cycle of peace, human beings at peace with the creator and all that God has created. Islam calls on people to love their neighbors communities to respect others, governments to foster justice for everyone. But sometimes human beings refuse God's call or communities act in fear of others or governments act unjustly. Every faith tradition calls us to peace and inspires us to new beginnings when we fall short. But what about those who justify their violence by their religion? A young man belonged to a faith community, but was radicalized online. He wrote a manifesto, killed nine people, and wanted to inspire others to continue a cycle of violence, claiming God was on his side. Dylan Roof was a Christian. We know his terrible actions do not reflect what Jesus taught, because we know Christians. We don't trust the KKK to speak for Jesus. We should not let criminals speak for Islam. Instead, we should look to the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran. The Prophet Muhammad said, You will not enter paradise until you believe, and you will not believe until you love each other. Shall I show you something that, if you did, you would love each other? Spread peace between yourselves. Likewise, the Quran teaches Muslims how to respond when they are harmed. The good deed and the evil deed are not equal. Repel evil by that deed which is better, and thereupon the one who is an enemy will become as though he was a devoted friend. The Quran further asserts a powerful message about the oneness of humanity and the mandate to do good. O oh, humankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female, and made you into nations and tribes that ye may get to know each other, and not that ye may despise each other. Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of God is the one who is the most righteous of you. Violence exists among people in all traditions. It is a human problem. Amplified in the world today because of colonialism, power dynamics, politics and foreign policies, hopelessness, loneliness, and more. The biggest threat of mass violence on U.S. soil is actually from white supremacists and American Muslims are more likely than other faith groups to reject attacks on civilians. Islam continues to call Muslims to participate in a cycle of peace. As the Prophet Muhammad said, 
the best of people are those that bring most benefit to the rest of humankind. He further taught that there is a reward for serving any animate living being. Let's work together to answer this call to bring benefit to society and serve humanity together. Please check out our links in the YouTube description. Thank you so much, dear Reverend Terry, for sharing that video with us. Uh, again, my name is Anila, uh, and I want to share a little bit about my own background, further details, just to start us in, in this conversation, uh, because this is a pretty difficult topic uh, for a lot of folks, because this is one of the myths that's used by the anti-Muslim hate groups uh, to promote dehumanization of Muslims in our country. So I was actually born to Muslim parents, you may have heard this last week, uh, and I was raised with certain Islamic values like honesty, service, justice, uh, and hard work, but I was really a Ramadan Muslim. You know, practicing my faith during the month of Ramadan and not really beyond that, kind of like Easter Christians or uh, Christmas Christians as well. I was so fortunate to be the first in my family to get to go to college and get a degree. And it was in college that I actually chose Islam for myself. But as I tell people, I chose it at that time just with my mind, and it didn't really change my behavior in any way. I continued on to law school, which was just beyond my dreams even, but it wasn't until after making partner at a law firm and then working as general counsel of a healthcare IT company that I actually had my spiritual transformation. And that's when Islam really changed my heart and inspired me to make significant change in my life. Those changes included leaving my legal career with nothing but sort of faith and trust in God and hoping everything's gonna work out in order to pursue service and knowledge, two things that are just so important in Islam. And my desire was to pursue my passions, to live out my true purpose in life, and to find peace of mind, spirit, and heart. In fact, Islam comes from the root word for peace, and it means submission to God. The idea is that by submitting our will to God, doing the good that God wants us to do, that we actually achieve peace both internally within ourselves and with the environment and people around us. Muslims believe all the prophets, including Noah, Abraham, Moses, uh, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all, that they were Muslim, at least with a lowercase m, because they submitted their will to God. And some are actually surprised to hear that Muslims believe in these prophets and all the other prophets that are mentioned in the Bible. The Muslim greeting, assalamu alaikum, means peace be upon you or peace be with you as we hear in the Christian tradition as well. And Muslims close every single prayer, which Muslims are required to do five times a day if they're following the faith, by sending salams or peace to everyone on our right and everyone on our left. So as I was learning more about Islam and practicing the five daily prayers, I personally was finding peace. I was becoming a better person. And it wasn't just me, I saw this in my family as well. It was a beautiful change that we were experiencing in our daily lives. We were becoming softer, gentler, more patient and kinder people. But our lived experience and the actual teachings of Islam that we were learning and reading about contrasted significantly to the narrative about Islam and Muslims in media, in politics and in popular culture. That's why for the past seven years, I've been working on addressing this huge divide that exists on building bridges and getting to know each other and following the sacred teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, and others about loving God and loving our neighbors as ourselves. And I'll be honest and say that without my spiritual transformation, I actually would not have the strength, the spiritual strength to do some of the work that I do. It's actually my faith that teaches me to act humbly and respond with words of peace, even to those who may drive by and yell obscenities at me. It's actually my faith that teaches me to ignore the haters and not let them make me swerve from doing what's right and just. It's my faith that teaches me to show mercy and kindness on earth, even when people may not deserve it because I want God to show me mercy. 
And, and I say all of this to help show some of the teachings of Islam, again, not to proselytize, but to show why it was so different from what I was seeing and hearing in media. And believe me, I've been tested on these teachings, as I know others have as well with their religious teachings. I, I remember one example in particular, and I just mentioned this last week, was at an anti-Muslim hate rally when people were coming at me with literal anti-Muslim messages and I still was able to talk to them and help connect on a human level because that's what my faith teaches me. And I see this sort of all the time in the work that I do, the huge divide between what Islam teaches versus what people wrongly think that Islam teaches. For example, in Islam, there is an emphasis on kindness as a mark of faith, on service and bringing benefit to humanity that the best of people are those who bring benefit to society, to the rest of humanity, on doing good, seeking justice, spreading peace, and so much more. And these are similar to the teachings of Christianity and other faith and wisdom traditions. Any of the world's great religions are intended to make us better human beings. But there is an intentional misinformation campaign that promotes a false narrative about Islam and Muslims, this is the industry of anti-Muslim hate groups that Reverend Terry talked about la during last week's webinar. And one of the strongest tools of misconception that they use is to promote false information about Islam and violence. And they do this by taking an Arabic word, jihad, and attributing horrible meanings to it, and then supporting such wrong views with verses from the Quran taken out of context and without proper understanding. So let's talk about this because we wanna directly you know, address the misinformation and the myths. First off, it's important to know that the sanctity of life is significant in Islam, again, just like in other faith traditions. The Quran specifically has a verse talking about how taking one life unjustly is like taking all life and how saving one life is like saving all of humanity. Moreover, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught that a Muslim is one from, from whom people are safe physically, and even verbally. So then what about jihad? Well, jihad means to strive, to struggle, to exert effort. It is in fact a struggle to do good. And Prophet Muhammad taught that the greatest jihad is to battle our own soul, to fight the evil inclinations and desires within ourselves. This is the major jihad. And it has both an individual and societal component. Individually, it includes overcoming our own ego or laziness, refraining from doing wrong, restraining our anger, praying five times a day, fasting during Ramadan, showing kindness to our parents, and actually not even saying oof to our parents. That's literally in the Quran. And I tell you, that's a, that's a challenge at times. <laughs> Societally, it includes things like speaking truth to power, struggling uh, for justice, serving those in need, creating the positive change that we wanna see and so much more. And this is all part of the major jihad that every single Muslim, indeed every single person has to struggle with in this world. Then there's what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, himself identified as the minor jihad which is physical confrontation. It is the struggle in the battlefield for self-defense or to fight against tyranny and oppression. It is not supposed to be aggressive action. This minor jihad recognizes that there's a role for protection at times when a person needs to protect themselves or others from harm or oppression, or when a nation needs to protect its citizens. In such cases of protection, the use of force may be justified. And in fact, here in our country, this is why we have over 10,000 American Muslims who have served our country in the, in the interest of protection and defense. But this kind of use of force or physical struggle, the minor jihad in Islam, it's only permissible in limited circumstances with certain specific boundaries. The verses in the Quran that speak about fighting and war are in this limited defensive context. Unfortunately, specific verses are often taken out of context, either by critics or haters of Islam who are discussing jihad, 
or even by misguided Muslims themselves who wish to justify their aggressive, vile behavior or tactics. For example, verse 190 in chapter two of the Quran, and this is something that is often quoted by folks, the fight in the cause of God, it's portrayed as a command to fight in Islam. <clears throat> but if you read the full verse, you actually get a different picture. It specifically says, those who fight you, but do not transgress for God loves not transgressors. This whole passage, if you understand the context and history, is about fighting in defense against the warring Meccan tribes, the Quraysh, who were perpetrators of religious persecution and even torture. And the passage clearly prohibits fighting against those who are not fighting. So it's so important for us to read these verses, religious scripture in general, in context. This is true for the Quran, just as much as it's true for the Bible, because context matters. Another common misquoted verse in the Quran is the so-called kill them where you find them verse that you often hear people mention. And to properly address that, we need some historical context. Muslims and Muhammad per, uh, were persecuted by the Quraysh. They were harassed and tortured even for 13 years while they were in Mecca. There were several assassination attempts on the life of Muhammad, and still they didn't have permission from God to even sort of fight in self-defense. The Muslims were driven out of their homes. They fled persecution by going to Medina where the, the city invited Prophet Muhammad to join them there. They were welcomed there. But the Quraysh, they seized the property of the Muslims from Mecca. They stole sort of, uh, that's the, uh, they sold those stolen goods that they seized. Finally, in the second year in Medina, sort of 15 years into revelation coming to, to Muhammad, Muslims were finally granted permission to fight their oppressors. That's when they had the Battle of Badr, where 313 Muslims defeated an army of 1,000 soldiers from the Quraysh. And after that battle, there were other battles before the Muslims finally were able to enter into a 10-year peace treaty with the Quraysh in the year 628. And that treaty actually allowed Islam to grow peacefully. But the Quraysh, again, they violated that treaty two years later. But by this time, the Muslim community had grown to about 100,000. And they marched to Mecca when the Quraysh violated their treaty. They were able to conquer Mecca, mostly peacefully. And during this time, during this conquest of Mecca, Muhammad was humble. He had his head down, praying to God as he's coming into the city and even as sort of as a conqueror, which is not the usual image we have of conquerors. And he actually said to the Quraysh, though the same people who had killed and tortured not only his followers, but even his own family members, he said to them something so powerful. He actually repeated the, the, the words that, that we're, we're told Prophet Joseph, peace be upon him, said to his brothers in forgiving them for what they did to him. He said, have no fear this day, go your way, you are all free. And in that context, revelation came, came down saying that these criminals, these enemies who fought you all this time, give them four months to think about the faith. Allow them to be in safety so they are not intimidated in any way or forced in any way. And if they choose to accept Islam, accept them as your brothers and sisters and their equal citizens. If they choose to leave, they can do so peacefully. Make sure they're allowed to leave if they choose to do that. But if they choose to remain in Mecca and they continue fighting you, then the verse says, kill them where you find them. This is not at all a sort of general policy or something that applies beyond the specific instance there where we're told the messenger of God was present, where a four month amnesty was applied and God, we believe, brought an end to the war between the Muslims and the Quraysh. So without this kind of context, you can manipulate religious texts to support sort of anything you want and justify some of the even harmful behavior that people, including some Muslims, unfortunately engage in. And if you want more information about this, there are a couple sources here on the screen that talk more about how various verses from the Quran are misquoted and abused and you can, there's a video as well that, that goes into uh, more detail on this. So the verses that allow for physical combat, they're very conditional allowance in certain limited circumstances to defend against aggression or oppression. 
And even where fighting was allowed or is allowed in Islam, it comes with very strict limitations. Here are just some of the kinds of limitations that are supposed to apply. And more, more importantly than that, there's always an emphasis on peace, on seeking peace. This is something that Islam strongly encourages. And we have various verses in the Quran that support this as well. That if the enemy, if those fighting you essentially offer peace, then you don't have any cause to continue fighting against people like, you know, who are not fighting you. And also, oops, if they incline to peace, then also you're supposed to pursue peace. The mandate to fight was during a time of desperate struggle for survival that the Muslim community was subjected to by its enemies. And when that danger was over, when Muhammad was in a position of power and he could do as he pleased, he actually forgave even his enemies and let them go. And when you think about the kinds of people he forgave, they included Hind, who had literally ordered the assassination of Muhammad's uncle. And not only did she do that, she even literally went on the battlefield and cannibalized Muhammad's uncle, just to show sort of the, the kind of vile hatred that she had to, towards Muhammad. But that the, the behavior of Muhammad in response to even forgiving people like Hind actually reveals the true essence of Islam. And it's what Muhammad actually taught his followers, that you're supposed to show forgiveness and kindness even to those who do you wrong. Now, of course, not all Muslims follow the example of Muhammad or the teachings of Islam, just like not all Christians follow what Jesus uh, taught. But there are many Muslims who do. And, and these stories of forgiveness and kindness are oftentimes the ones that are missing from media, but they are so powerful. Like Rukhaya, who forgave the, the man who killed her son and even hugged him and his mother at the court hearing based on Islamic values of kindness and forgiveness and mercy. I personally know Muslims who have experienced hate-based violence themselves or their family members, but still responded in what is actually a truly Islamic way. Somebody who works with me had her grandfather literally killed with a shovel in, as a hate-based violence in Portland, Oregon. And the family chose not to pursue sort of uh, further charges and then really show the kind of love and forgiveness that's needed. There is somebody who's in, in our sort of Seattle area uh, race Bouillon, who's considered uh, sort of the face of forgiveness because he was shot in the face. And not only did he forgive his shooter, but he actually fought so that his shooter would not uh, receive the death penalty. Now, I'm not saying that we all have to have that level of just incredible spirit, nor is that always sort of, you know, what, what's expected uh, when, when we face uh, sort of this kind of direct harm to ourselves or our family members, our loved ones. I don't know if I would have that kind of strength in all honesty. But there are these stories out there. Um, and I've, again, I personally know people who've been transformed, uh, including people who were formerly anti-Muslim sort of haters who were transformed by the love and the kindness and the mercy they saw and, and experienced from actual Muslims, like Richard McKinney, like Ted Hakey Jr. Uh, and others that we can go into their stories as well. But despite the reality of so many individuals that have lived out Islamic values, those are not the stories or, uh, or narratives that dominate. Instead, there has been a consistent demonizing of Muslims and Islam through media, Hollywood, pop culture, talk shows, and more that present Islam and Muslims as a specific threat. In fact, according to research from Media Tenor, Islam is the most often mentioned religion in mainstream media, and 80% of that coverage is negative and even defamatory. And another study that analyzed the New York Times found that over 25 years, the New York Times portrayed Islam and Muslims more negatively than cancer and cocaine. And with, with, with this kind of coverage, fanatic fringes who may appear in shows like Homeland or 24 or on Fox News, they become the norm instead of everyday Muslims like me or the 3 million other American Muslims in our country. And contrary to the media's narrative, American Muslims, in fact, reject violence more than other Americans, or at least equal to, according to research from the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, both uh, civilian attacks by the military and, yeah, both civilian attacks 
and then also attacks by individuals or groups. And when it comes to actual threats in our country, you heard it from Irvin Terry, you heard it in the video, uh, and I, I, I think we've seen report after report about this, that the biggest security threat in our country, on our land, is actually not from people who look like me, or like my brother, or my father, but more often people who look like this. Even though statistically, the majority of mass violence in our country is in fact committed by white men, most people don't fear white men as a group, nor should we, I wanna be clear about that. According to the FBI, 94% of terror attacks on American soil between 1980 and 2005 were committed by non-Muslims. That's some of the most long-term data available from the FBI. More recently from that, there was an investigative report in 2017 that found that uh, most violent extremism in the US comes from sort of the uh, extremist, uh, uh, white, white uh, extremists. And we compromise security in our nation when we focus so much on Islam. That report confirmed prior reports and statistics and other ones since then, including the Department of Homeland Security, once again, sort of reminding us even this past year in their report that white supremacists remain the biggest source of lethal threat to our country. But the facts and the stats, they don't change hearts and minds. People still have stereotypes of Muslims and other people of color in a way that they do not have about our white brothers and sisters. Now, I'm not saying that all Muslims are good. There definitely are those who, who are sort of, who commit violence or do other wrong. I and Muslims around the world have repeatedly, consistently, and categorically condemned violence by such individuals or groups. And it sickens me when such murderers or criminals seek to justify their behavior, their vile actions with religion. But the mainstream narrative is written in a way to make certain groups appear to be a bigger threat, a greater threat than they are. And this is why some people get labeled the T word, terrorist, with the associated group blame. And others who engage in similar action are often described simply as lone wolves with mental problems or troubled kids, like Dylan Roof, the white supremacist who took the lives of nine African-Americans in a church in Charleston, or Stephen Paddock, who, who uh, took the lives of 58 in Las Vegas, or Nicholas Cruz of the Florida massacre. None of them were labeled the T word, despite their terrorizing actions. And these are for the cases that, we actually, that actually get media attention. There are many others that are not even covered in the news. Media bias shows up both in whether stories are covered and how they're covered, depending on if the perpetrator or victims are Muslim. And in fact, there's a study from ISPU, again, that uh, really talks about this. And I'm gonna to try to play this video if I can. Have you ever felt like some new stories receive a lot more coverage than others of equal importance? You're not imagining it. For example, in 2010, Justin Carl Moose, a self-described Christian counterpart to Osama bin Laden, planned to blow up an abortion clinic. He possessed all the means to make his own explosives, but was exposed by the FBI before actually carrying out his plot. Never heard of Moose? Perhaps that's because his case received little media coverage. Neither the New York Times nor the Washington Post ran a single story about him. For his alleged crime, Moose was sentenced to two and a half years in prison. Compare that case to Antonio Martinez. He was alleged to have acted in the name of Islam when he planned to bomb a military recruitment station outside Baltimore and shoot personnel as they fled the scene. Like Moose, Martinez was also arrested before he had the chance to act on his plot. However, unlike Moose, law enforcement provided Martinez with a fake bomb. Martinez received significantly more media attention. Combined, the New York Times and Washington Post published 10 articles about him. Martinez was charged with planning to use a weapon of mass destruction and was sentenced to 25 years in federal prison. This is not an isolated incident. 
ISPU's Equal Treatment Report compares the legal and media responses to perpetrators perceived to be Muslim and alleged to be acting in the name of a religious ideology with perpetrators not perceived to be Muslim, allegedly acting in the name of another ideology, such as white supremacy. And the differences are striking. Perpetrators perceived to be Muslim received four times the sentencing and 770% more media coverage. And they were seven times more likely to have the weapons supplied by law enforcement than their non-Muslim counterparts. These kinds of disparities misinform the public, fuel suspicion and prejudice, and make us all less safe. Equal conduct should receive equal treatment. Check out all of ISPU's findings in our report, Equal Treatment, measuring the legal and media responses to ideologically motivated violence in the United States at www.ispu.org. So this kind of sort of double standards that we see contributes to people's perceptions of sort of who are the threats in our country. And a clear result of this kind of narrative problem is the Washington Times media headline uh, reporting on a study. This media, uh, this uh, article was reporting on a study that came out of Duke and the University of North Carolina. And that study, like others, found that the majority of fatalities in terms of domestic terrorism were at the hands of white national extremists. But the headline of this article read, majority of fatal attacks on U.S. soil carried out by white supremacists, not terrorists. Let that sink in. It's almost by definition we've reserved that T word for a specific group. And that's why it's even used as an anti-Muslim slur. And I have to say, friends, we ourselves, we're able to differentiate one violent Christian criminal from the religion because we know enough about Christianity and Christians to not fear all of Christianity or all Christians when one does something bad. Imagine instead if all we heard about Christianity were the Dylan Roofs or the KKKs of the world. And imagine if we combined that with certain violent verses of the, of the Bible taken out of context, like Luke 19.27, where Jesus is quoted as saying, but those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Or Matthew 10.34, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have, come to, uh, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. That gives you a sense of what's happening with the Quran, Muslims, and Islam in our country. And now just to clarify, I know that that out of context quote from Luke 19, 27, for instance, is from a parable. And I know that Jesus, peace be upon him, did not teach hate or killing. He taught and embodied love. And he said that the greatest commandments are loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. Muslims believe in these love teachings of Jesus, and they were similar to the teachings of Muhammad, peace be upon him as well, about how you can't have faith without loving each other. And I also know that Christianity does not teach hate or killing, despite many examples of people who may hate or may have killed in the name of Christianity, because I've learned Christianity from Christians, not anti-Christians. Unfortunately, most of our fellow Americans have learned Islam not from Muslims, but anti-Muslims. And that's the problem, especially when there is this well-funded infrastructure that promotes and profits off this campaign of misinformation and manipulation. And this, is, this anti-Muslim industry continues that same narrative of fear, scapegoating, and otherization used against other communities, other minority communities as well. As I said last week, the narrative and the script, they're similar, all you got to do is change the characters and the labels. And that's how the, the, the word terrorist gets used the same way that, that the word, you know, another T word, thug, has been used in a different script to, again, demonize, criminalize, and terrorize entire communities. And it's a tool that is weaponized and used as, as a way to divide we the people. But these tools of oppression, they only work if we allow them to. And we actually have a choice and the power to prevent this kind of manipulation, misinformation, and fear mongering. And that's what our whole Facts Over Fear campaign is about. Because regardless of our faith or no faith backgrounds, we have more in common with each other than any of us might with fringe elements of our own faith or wisdom traditions, or those haters who seek to destroy or hurt others. And we should be uniting and standing against all harm and violence, recognizing how much our safety, our security, our well-being are directly connected. 
And as I said last week, together we can promote a different narrative from the one by the anti-Muslim industry that in fact hurts all of us as Americans. We can promote facts over fear. We can choose love over hate and commit to our pledge of one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anila. And, and now I'm gonna share my screen for a few minutes and, and we'll have time in just a, a couple of minutes for some questions. We have a couple of good ones so far and we encourage you to, to, to uh, continue sharing those. Um, so I'll just share my screen and take you through a, a little bit here um, on that, on the notion of, of jihad, but I want to start off with this little meme that we've created. Uh, Pharaoh, you know, back in Egypt many, many centuries ago, claimed divine sanction for enslaving people. Uh, Pharaoh was claimed to be the son of the god Ray, and therefore, you know, he could do whatever he wanted to do. He could enslave people and, and call it good. So he was essentially using uh, religion to keep people quiet and obedient to an unjust system. And what we have with uh, the, the, gr the growth of the Abrahamic traditions, and again, we're not trying to proselytize anybody, we're just trying to explain, the growth of the Abrahamic traditions really were about a response to use of, the, of, of religion to sort of maintain or support or make unjust systems seem inevitable, right? And so there were two parts, two core teachings of the Abrahamic tradition. The first is to love God more than your tribe or tradition and second, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So the first one is to sort of love the God beyond our idea of God, who in fact created all humanity. And therefore, we, we should not otherize or demonize or hate people just because they come from a different religion or tradition, because they eat uh, a different food or they wear different clothes or speak a different language. So we're to love the God beyond our idea of God who cannot be controlled by anybody. Um, and recognize that that impels us to love our neighbor because we're able to recognize our neighbor as human. And that's sort of the shortest course on the Abrahamic traditions that I can manage, right? So uh, the whole idea of jihad is actually, you know, throughout the Christian faith as well. Um, there's all kinds of terms that are very similar around, uh, you know, following Jesus or being a faithful member of a tradition it revolves around effort it takes work. When we live inside of a society, you know, that society gets placed in us as well. We're not just living in it. Our, our heart and mind and perceptions get aligned with it. And to the extent that that society is unjust, we have to do internal work to try to figure out, you know, how to see the world differently and how to work for change. Uh, within the Christian tradition, um, we also have a very similar notion of character development, that we have to struggle and work at that um, because we have some vulnerabilities as human beings toward anger or toward demonizing other people, for instance, and we have to work on ourselves. And then there's also a very powerful sense within the Christian tradition and, and Jewish tradition as well in terms of working for justice and peace in society. And, uh, and, they're, they're, and so all of those sort of notions of jihad are very much part of the Christian faith. So one of the challenges, of course, is that um, just as Pharaoh, you know, used a religion in a way to kind of justify an unjust system of slavery, enslavement of other people, well, sometimes the Abrahamic tradition has been used the same way. And so as a Christian, I want to, you know, call out Christians here for a minute. Um, this is uh, it, from 1452, Pope Nicholas V was asked by the king and queen of Spain um, to justify or provide divine sanction for violence against Muslims and Jews and other people. And this is what Pope Nicholas wrote to provide that sanction. Uh, we grant you by these present documents with our apostolic authority, full and free permission to invade, search out, capture and subjugate the Saracens, that is the Muslims and pagans and any other unbelievers, which probably included Jewish people, right? And enemies of Christ, wherever they may be, as well as their kingdoms, duchies, counties, principalities, and other property, and to reduce their persons to perpetual servitude. So this is divine sanction for a king and queen being able to take over anybody's land anywhere if they're not Christian. I can't imagine Jesus saying okay to that. Okay, I can't imagine that. 
And yet that's what the leaders of the church did at that point in, in Spain and throughout Europe. And so we have to recognize that, that every religion can be used. Every philosophy can be used. Every group identity can be used to promote and justify violence once it starts. Now, the important piece is this, that the kings and queens of Europe, for instance, um, often used religion as an excuse or a scapegoat for the violence that they wanted to perpetrate. So they not only used religion to justify their violence, they used it to excuse their violence to say, well, that wasn't really me, that was really them. But in reality, it was in fact um, the kings and queens. So the last century, for instance, was probably the least religious century in the history of humanity. But we saw 262 million people murdered in genocide. Much of the time, that was by people who had no faith at all. And so what has happened a bit around uh, understanding Muslims and Islam is that we've taken some negative assumptions about religion in general and placed them all on our Muslim sisters and brothers as well. So there have been a number of studies talking about the role of war, of religion in war. And the BBC did a study and found that only 15% of major conflicts had some kind of religious motivation. Um, Phillips and Axelrod said it was only 7%. Gordon Martell said six. And of those percentages, all of them say that religion played kind of a relatively minor role. That normally it wasn't the G word for God that was the source of it, it was the G word for greed. Greed was the source of that. And the same is true when we talk about uh, political violence. So people who study political violence and where it comes from have found that typically the ideology comes later. There's other rationale and motivations for engaging in some kind of violence. Um, but actually what they try to do is that as they're preparing for violence or after they've done it, they start to try to find ways to justify it. And that's how, that's how it happens so many, many times. And so what we just want to help us recognize is that we, we often overestimate the role of ideology in violence when really there's economic or other kinds of issues that people have experienced. And so I just want to share with you that the Prophet Muhammad lived approximately 24,000 days. And, you know, if, if all of the false information about Muslims and Islam were true, right, how many of those days do you think he would have engaged in some kind of combat? Well, it's only six, right? So if, if violence was at the root of the thing, you'd think he would have been more faithful, right, and done more. But he was faithful, and he only did it six days. And of those six days, how many were done aggressively, how many were done in offense? And the answer is zero. So our whole like picture of, of Islam and Muslims has been so shaped in many respects by the same kind of, of, uh, of perspective um, as, as a Pope, Pope Nicholas V shared in 1452, trying to dehumanize an entire group so that the kings and queens of Spain can go ahead and do what they want and take their land and enslave them. And so we've got a lot of work to do in our entire society to stop applying collective blame to each other, to work for, uh, to uphold the freedom and the human rights of every single person and not allow our differences to become sources of violence toward each other and to recognize where the true sources of, of violence are in this, in this country. Right now we saw on January 6th, a lot of white nationalist groups and groups that claim to be Christian. We saw people carrying crosses right outside there and then went on in and hurt our police officers there. And so we have to recognize that, that all human beings are vulnerable uh, to getting so fearful and so angry that we engage in violence. But we have to recognize that typically uh, thoughts of ideology come much later and are used only to justify. And we got to make sure that we don't allow us ourselves to justify our violence um, on the basis of, of religion or philosophy. So with that, we just want to invite all of you to, um, to respond to any questions. And there's one that Beth asked about Anila, and, and I'll, I'll just try this first, Anila, and then you, you go. She said she noticed that sometimes Anila uses the word God when the on-screen word is Allah. So when I went to, um, 
to Israel and Palestine, um, I went to a, a, an Episcopal church that was Arabic speaking. And the word that they use uh, for, for God in the, in the Arabic Bible is Allah. Allah is just the everyday, like, you know, open, so, open sourced word for God in Arabic. And, uh, and that's all it is. And so, um, so sometimes Muslims will say Allah, sometimes they say God. In, in the same way that people who speak multiple languages, you know, get different parts of their language in, um, uh, they use both languages in certain sentences. Anila, how about you? Yeah, so thank you, Beth, for the question. And I, I would agree that Arabic just simply is the Arabic word for God. But the reason that some Muslims may at times choose to specifically use Allah rather than God, even when speaking in English, uh, is because Allah is, is unique. And the word God, if you think about it, it can be sort of genderized by, by God or goddess. It can be sort of made plural by saying gods. Um, it can sort of be used in different contexts where we talk about like, you know, the god of music or the god you know th different ways like that and by preserving the uniqueness of our creator versus the creation for that reason muslims at times specifically say allah even when they said the rest of the the sentence in uh, in english uh, i try to just go with god uh, for ease so that's probably why i use god uh, more than than allah even if the text may say allah at times so i hope that clarifies and answers that question I mean, Christ, Christians do that all the time too. We got the word Eucharist in, in Roman Catholic, Episcopal, Lutheran traditions. That's a Greek word. Most people don't drop Greek words into every sentence, you know, so it's, it's, that's sort of the reason there. Um, Yep. Uh, another uh, comment here, uh, more than a question that I wanted to address is uh, the fact that more perpetrators of violence in the U.S. are white seems statistically reasonable as more people in the U.S. on the whole are white. Not a matter of pride, certainly, but statistically reasonable. And I would I would agree with that. I don't disagree with that at all. Uh, the majority of people in our country are white, so it makes sense that the majority of violence uh, is sort of statistically matches that. But the concern is when certain marginalized communities statistically are much smaller, but they are sort of outsized in terms of the perception of their threat. That's the, the sort of the, the double standard that I wanted to highlight, that even though Muslims are not, in fact, the biggest threat in our country, they are per perceived that way by some, they are promoted that way by some. And in fact, this hurts all of us as Americans, as I mentioned last week, and then we talk about uh, in general uh, right now too, is that sort of focus on specifically identifying Muslims as a source of threat makes us all less safe because it takes the resources and the time and the attention away from the actual sources of threat to all of us as Americans. This is why it's so important for us to call for evidence-based investigations into all criminal behavior, into all sorts of forms of violence. That way we can make sure that implicit bias doesn't affect our law enforcement or FBI or DHS in terms of how they treat different sources of threat in our country. And that way we can all be much safer. So I hope you know, that, I just, that helped address that. Go ahead, yeah, Terry. I, I just wanna add, you know, I think it's very clear that we, we tend to discount the the perpetrators of violence uh, from groups that we're we're part of that we perceive ourselves to be part of, you know, and and so we, we sort of discount that because we know that that that's not the norm, right? And uh, and so we also I think have a tendency to judge groups that we are don't perceive ourselves to be part of, you know, more harshly. Uh, President former President George W. Bush said this really beautifully when he said we often judge others by their worst actions and ourselves by our best intentions. And that is also widespread you know, religious teaching. Uh, Jesus said, take the log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of someone else's. In other words, we have a tendency as human beings to judge others pretty harshly, but it's really important to take a step back and ask you, well, we, is that, is that uh, sort of response to a, a, a situation like really fair? And, and so we have to kind of ourselves. And I think this is an opportunity uh, for Americans across across the board to always ask ourselves if we see some somebody you know do something who's part of a group, let's work really hard not to apply collective blame to that group, because part of what that does is not only get us off kilter in terms of what we're investigating, as Anila talked about, but it also creates a lot of tension and anxiety in our larger population that sometimes unbalanced people get get so wrapped up in that they you know go on trains and try to stab people like happened in Portland. 
So we got to make sure that we're speaking about people in fair and equitable ways so that we reduce the fear. Yeah, if anybody else has questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat or, or use the Q&A feature. Um, I, I will point out, this is something that Terry very quickly uh, discussed before we showed the video, which is our specific messaging approach approach uh, to effectively sort of change hearts and minds. And when we say change hearts and minds, we don't mean, again, we do not at all mean proselytize or convert people, nothing like that. It's about removing that fear, that negative emotion, that anger that sort of, uh, you know, really uh, is in people because of the misinformation that's promoted by hate groups. And as I said last week, I've personally witnessed people when they've had that sort of uh, transformation of having that kind of negative energy from themselves cells removed. Um, and they're all of a sudden like, whoa, you know, and, and being able to see each other as human beings and stand up for the rights of, and dignity and respect for all of us. That's what it's really about. But I'm going to ask, uh, uh, I'm going to ask specifically, Terry, you know, if, if you have somebody come to you and express the fear or concern about Muslims, how, how do you respond as a pastor, as, as a sort of a Christian, not as a Muslim, how would you respond to that? Yeah, so you know, I want to start off with the, with honoring their their feelings and their emotions because fear is extremely powerful. It goes right to our survival instincts and, and everything, and so and it's easily activated. And we have a lot of media and everybody else trying to activate that to get keep our eyeballs on that screen all the time, right? And so first, I just want want to acknowledge that feeling, um, but I also want to do that without repeating negative messages and that sort of thing. And, and, and second, you know, I want to help them, I want to help share a positive story about the group that they're fearful of. Because again, fear is not just hurting the, the feared of group, it's hurting the person who's captivated by it, right? And then I want to, I want to build on some shared values that I, that I share with that person. And then I want to take them on a journey over time um, to help them go meet some folk from the group that they're kind of afraid of. Because again, you know, uh, most people are just people. They're, they're living life. They're trying to care for their family. They care about their community. They help their neighbors with their garbage. You know, when, they, when they're away for vacation, I mean, most folk really intend well. And we need to help like reduce the fear and help us to see each other as people who are in this together. Right. And, but that, that starts off with recognizing the emotion and then taking people on a journey to go meet some folk. Because once we meet each other and get to know each other, the fear gets reduced and the facts can come can come through. Thank you. Um, I know it's I, I know it's a, I know we got like like one minute to go here, Anila. So you want to yeah. say something? To well, I just wanted to say Ashley wanted to ask a question. So I want to make sure we give her a chance to ask the question. We'll try to cover it very, very briefly. Oh, yeah. Well, unfortunately, I, not unfortunately, I think you kind of answered it, but maybe touch on it a little bit more. One of the questions I get a lot um, and as someone that doesn't really practice a particular faith, um, wouldn't it be better to just teach general acceptance practices? Um, and this is, a, again, a question I get, and I know how I would respond to that. But, um, you know, is it, is it sometimes more divisive to teach these different groups practices? And, or should we just teach a general, this is how you accept everyone? How would you respond to that question? Thank you so much, Ashley, for the question. Uh, I would say that, uh, of course, the work we do is part of teaching general acceptance, but we have to focus on some of the specific lies and misinformation that are promoted against certain groups and not against all groups. Unless we understand what those lies are and what the truth about it is, it's hard to, to get to the point of general acceptance, especially for these marginalized communities. You know, I, I hear this a lot with sort of uh, the talking about uh, Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter, right? Or specifically in the context of if there's specifically one source of threat or harm, if there's one house that's on fire, you can't just say, hey, we should just promote you know safety and security for everyone generally you have to address the fire in that one house because otherwise it can bring us all down and it compromises the safety and security of all of us so that's a quick answer i, I would love to have more time but terry yeah I'll, I'll just go briefly um i you know talking to a lot of rabbis over the last five or six years you know uh during the dehumanization that took place in in nazi germany uh the the dehumanization was very specific to that community Right. And so um, and so if you had stood up in Germany and said, well, we need to respect all life and we need to be nice to everybody, that's not going to answer those specific dehumanizations. Right. So we, we need to we need to work in, in, in the critical moment to protect specific communities when they're being challenged, when they're being dehumanized. 
as well as promoting universal human rights, universal tolerance, and understanding of our real and legitimate differences. And all of those are important. So both are important, the general and the specific, especially when dehumanization is taking place, which always leads to violence. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. I know we are at our time, so appreciate everybody joining us. I just want to point out that next week is going to be about Islam and women's rights. So we really hope you return for that conversation, which will be really uh, fascinating, I hope. Bye, everybody. Thank you for coming. Bye. Thank you for all being here. Yes. Appreciate it.